recordings and flash photography without the consent of the IEP use department is strictly prohibited. Thank you, enjoy the performance. History of the horn, from its roots as a signaling instrument for the hunt, through its introduction into the orchestra, the inclusion of the valve, what we know as the horn today. Along with a history lesson, you'll also hear live performances of solo works, chamber works, and orchestral excerpts. I have chosen them specifically to exemplify what composers have written for specific types of horns, as well as for the times of transition between horns. If you need a handout, or like a handout, or even a pencil, there will be some located on the stand in front of the door. Feel free to take notes. Uh, take notes. This is a learning environment. The predecessor of the horn was a form of shofar, an instrument typically used in Jewish ceremonies. The shofar is made from a ram's horn, hollowed out, and in carving a funnel into the pointy end, someone could buzz into this funnel shape sound one constant pitch, maybe even two of their one. Uh, the shofar replaced the form of rhythmic shouting called ue, which was used in a series of short and long spouts to, to communicate with other hunters. The shofar was uh, then used as it was easier to hear along greater distances and less taxing on the voice. The metal horn equivalent is a man-made, more refined version that makes it easier to produce a sound among longer distances. At this time, the metal man-made horn was still a rough shape of a shofar. Uh, this example being that of a Celtic war trumpet. Look how even though the bell is shaped like a horse, the overall shape of the trumpet is still similar to a shofar. The next slide is that of a Roman war trumpet. Notice how this one starts to coil around the body. This was done so it could be easier to carry a longer amount of tubing, uh, carry a longer amount of tubing, as with the longer amount of tubing, the lower the pitch in the harmonic series, which makes it easier to produce more than one sound. Speaking of the harmonic series, I would like to talk about the tone production of the horn and how it relates. As defined, a harmonic series is a sequence of sounds, pure tones represented by sine waves, in which the frequency of each sound is an integer multiple of the fundamental with the lowest frequency. What this means is that anything that produces a sound, like a string or a column of air, it can produce certain tones. Think of a military bugle for this aspect. All a bugle is, is a tube that you buzz into. There are no valves or keys to alter the pitch. The tone is changed by the speed of the vibration, which is affected by the air. Not the quality or quantity, but the speed. If you use slower air, it can produce a lower tone, and a faster air produces a higher tone. Being able to control this, you can produce a series of natural tones. This series is called the harmonic series. Now let's go back to the integer multiple of the lowest frequency part of the definition. On any given tube, you have the lowest possible pitch, whether it is physically playable or if the human ear can hear it. The next possible sound has half as long wavelengths as the first, meaning it vibrates twice as much. The next possible sound has a third of the length, then a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, and so on. I can demonstrate the speed on a right line of the garden.
Let's put this phenomenon into musical terms and an actual form. You have the fundamental pitch, then that uh, vibrates twice as much being the octave. The fundamental isn't playable on this setup, so the first note you will hear will be the second note of harmonic series. A perfect fifth vibrates three times as much as the fundamental pitch, a perfect fourth vibrates four times as much, and so on. Anything. 
Although the French were the first to use the hunting horn in 1664 ballet, The Princess of a Lie, uh, Jean Baptiste Louis, the Germans were uh, the ones to develop on playing technique and modernizing the horn. Louis XIV was noted to be the first to include the hunting horn into his holy orchestra, as he was a huge supporter of the arts. He loved the sound of the horn so much out in the hunts that he brought it back to the orchestra. To add to this, if you look at the score and it says F horn, it isn't an abbreviated French, it's more as a horn in F, as F has become the standard key for the modern instrument to be pitched to. In 1971, the International Horn Society suggested that the instrument be known as just horn in English. Not to be confused with the English horn that is also pitched in F, but is actually French. <laughs> The first mention of the horn being used in a musical setting occurs in Battles, Hunts, and Bird Songs by Tumen Sasado in 1545. After this feat, the composer of the next hundred years started to write for a hunting horn to set the mood for a piece, more of a sound than an instrument. Due to composers including the horn more and more often in their music, they started to make the instrument into specific keys to fit into the orchestra. A man named A.J. Hampel, who's also German, started experimenting with placing his hand in the bell while playing for tuning purposes when he discovered something between 1750 and 1760 that would change the instrument forever. He discovered that when you place your hand in the bell and fully choke off or stop the sound from leaving the horn, it would raise the pitch produced by about a half step. And by having your hand in the bell between stopped and open position, would lower by about a half a set. Using this combination with the harmonic series, you can play a diatonic scale with a combination of open, closed, and half stopped hand positions. But then it's right here. So normally you would just have these notes. passage in a horn player wouldn't have to scramble to switch between two crooks. 
Now, there are two common kinds of crooks or ways they would attach to the horn. The first one, I'll show here, the crooks will be added to the center of the horn. It also acts as a tuning slide, depending on how they would make it. The other way, which is more specific to the uh, little bits, is this horn here. This horn was made about 1790. The way they would do that is they would add crooks from the lean pipe. They would have as many as three or even four, depending on which maker is making the horn. And so you could actually have have a horn that actually reach all the way out to here with all the different attachments to it. And you can kind of see why this version that goes in the center of the horn would be a little bit easier to use because you're not trying to play all the way out here. Now we will perform the solo work, chamber work, in orchestral excerpts using the natural horn. First up is a solo work, the first movement of Mozart's third horn concerto in E flat. And there's some program notes uh, if you guys have a program, but roughly it says it is believed that Mozart had wrote six horn concertos in total, but only four of them have survived today in the way they are, or at least in completion. Uh, they were written for a good friend, the local cheesemaker, Ignaz Pika. It is believed that uh, Leibniz and Mozart had a really unique friendship because the dedication to his first horn concerto, K4, uh, K412, says, Wolfgang Amade Mozart takes pity on Lincoln, Ask Hogs and Simpleton at Vienna, March 27, 1783. Interesting fact about that, in the actual manuscript of the horn part in red ink, Mozart wrote insults and other comments to Lincoln that, when translated to English, are actually very inappropriate. <laughs> uh, and at this time, I'd like to invite Mrs. Keene up to the stage. And I pick the first movement of Mozart's third horn concerto because of how he writes for the horn. To start off, most of the beginning line is in the open notes of the overtone series, with those that require stopping having significance within the line. Nothing in the first movement was an accident. Every note had purpose harmonically, and every color was important. Uh, there is also not a lot of solo horn repertoire for the here.
original work by Johannes Brahms, titled The Horn Trio of the Sword. Composed in the spring of 1865, Brahms wrote this work with natural horn in mind, even though the valve horn had been around for a while. He thought the character of the valveless horn is what the piece needed as of delicate nature. Uh, he wrote this piece shortly after his mother had passed and may have intended to be part of a wordless record. Uh, it is considered to be the most significant chamber work for horn. Brahms was a perfectionist and would only put out uh, works he knew were good. For a chamber work, this was written in a very mature manner, meaning for a trio, Brahms wrote it like a symphony. It had four movements, and all of them were in standard form. He used his great harmonies, melodies, power writing, and chemiolas, just like in his other major works. In an important detail not listed in the program notes, Brahms did write this piece after his mother had passed, but he rented a cabin in the woods to seclude himself from society to grieve for his mother. This helped Brahms to write such an exposed, vulnerable work and images of being in the woods personally come to mind. Now, I would like to invite, along with Mrs. Keene, Mr. Perez to perform the one promise on the Thank you. 
Next to get an idea of the natural form in an orchestra setting, I invite Gabby Goral, Elizabeth Heckman, and Gina Baldoni to join me as we perform an excerpt from Carl and Maria von Weber's Overture de Freshness. While myself and the rest of the quartet will be using modern horns, we will be using hand horn technique or natural horn technique for this. We couldn't find four matching pitch natural horns. 
Uh, a Freshitz, or a Freshier in German folklore, is a marksman who, by contract with the devil, has attained a certain amount of bullets uh, destined to hit without fail whatever object he wishes. As the legend is usually told, six of the magic uh, bullets are thus subservient to the marksman's will, but the seventh is an absolute disposal of the devil himself. Faber started to write his opera in 1817 and finished in about 1812. The success of this opera exceeded Weber's expectations and became a success worldwide. An interesting fact, Mozart and Weber were related by marriage when Mozart married his cousin, Constanze.
Uh, the third example of an avatonic horn is this one. Uh, and it was nicknamed the Spaghetti Fork. <laughs> this model was more appreciated due to it being the widest of the three examples of the condensed stem system and it brought back the coil to the horn. This particular model of horn was created by Charles Joseph Sachs in 1826. If that name sounds familiar to you, he is the father of Adolf Sachs, the inventor of the saxophone. The Lavelle's, uh, the Lavelle's and instruments had been created. The first person to invent a prototype and place it onto the horn was Heinrich Stolzl. He had created a piston like valve seen here. Unlike the piston we know today, the tubing of the instrument will connect from the valve uh, to the valve from the very bottom uh, instead of through the side that we have today. Uh, I think it was through the appropriate tubing. With this system, it was common for uh, social valve instruments to have just two valves. Uh, as you can see in this diagram, the air would go through the lead pipe to the bottom of the left valve. If left open, the air would go immediately to the connection here and to the second valve. If we're depressed, uh, the valve would redirect the air through longer tubing. Then to the connection before reaching the second valve, the purpose would uh, lengthen, or add, uh, lengthen or shorten the amount of tubing the air goes through to change the pitch. The other common type of valve is known as a rotary valve. As seen here in the diagram, the valve rotates within itself and the casing. When left alone, the air travels through the valve into the next part of the instrument, but when rotated, it sends air through the crook of the horn. This being a short example of a crook, some believe that the rotary valve has a quicker response time than the piston valve, which is why it's so commonly used in the modern form. We will discuss the combinations of valves later in the second half of the presentation. Now that valves are all the rage with horn players and makers, composers started to write for a fully chromatic horn. Composers like Wagner, however, agreed that the valve horn was a great way to simplify the crook system and was favorable to being able to switch keys rather quickly when composing, but did not like that the character of the natural horn was lost. The compromise was that Wagner's horn players were allowed to use modern valve horns, but had to use natural horn technique. Wagner was quoted on calling the valve horn a brass viola. All the integrity that made the horn its own unique sound was lost. A little bit about uh, Lundgren, which is the excerpt we're going to play for it was first premiered in 1850, and was the start of an opera drama known as the Through Composed Music Drama. It was played act to act without the interruptions. Uh, Elsa and her new husband, we don't know his name yet, are ushered in on a well-known bridal chorus, and the couple expresses their love for each other. Uh, Orchard's words, however, in impress upon Elsa, she laments, laments that her name sounds so sweet in her husband's lips, that cannot utter his name. Pretty much, he was one of the uh, knights guarding the Holy Grail, and to become a knight, you were not allowed to give your real identity, so that's why she doesn't know it. And after a little while, she's pressured into revealing his identity, which causes a whole bunch of havoc, and it's a really good operation. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, a lot of drama. Now I would like to invite, it's already on stage, the Cow Quartet, we would play uh, the prelude to Act 3 of Lovren by Bob. Also, his name was. Um, <laughs>
stand up and stretch. Uh, use the restroom real quick. We'll Start off 
on the program is the first movement of Douglas Hill's jazz set for solo horn entitled Lost and Found. There is a segment in your program program notes about the more specific details. What we really need to know is that with this piece there's a lot of extended techniques, uh, a lot of quarter tones, so I'm not actually playing out of tune as much as following the directions. Um, and to demonstrate a couple of the extended techniques, I'll go through the next slide. So the first, uh, yeah, the top level notation that's seen on the PowerPoint means to play the first note of the triplet normally, and then using the hand and the embouchure to scoop and go <coughs> down with the pitch. And that's. <laughs> This is even, just means to play the notes even because this is a jazz piece, so in context it comes out. The fourth down from the left, the same note that gradually adds flags as you play along, which sound like this. A third column, the V for the squiggly line, means to use vibrato, something that is normally forbidden on the instrument. Lastly, fourth column, third from the bottom, has X's as note heads. Uh, these are called ghost tones. You don't actually play them where they're more inferred of anything. Uh, yes? Is there a lot many more uh, notations just like this in this movement, as well as three full pages of explanation for the different notes that are used? Yeah, that's a good question. 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 Yeah, that's a good Thank you. 
of their pitch. Uh, both just picking out these notes as well as a fully chromatic scale uh, from F to F, below the bass clef staff up to the top of the treble staff. To demonstrate the range of the modern horn, I asked the Kyle Quartet to come back up and we would play the excerpt of Dimitri Shostakovich's Symphony Number no. 5. I picked this excerpt because of its use of hard writing and range. The horns play as a 2D section with power and force, compared to the vapor, it was a dumb duet stuff. This excerpt also differs that unlike the vapor, the whole section is playing on the same key horn. Unlike the Wagner, the section is unison until the end. In the Wagner, the horns were in the same key at the same time, but would split off into dyads and chords. Another key difference is that unlike previous horn writing, where the first and third horns were the high horn specialists, and the second and fourth horns were the low horn specialists, uh, this excerpt makes it so the entire horn section has to play anywhere between a low B flat and bass low staff to either a G or B flat above the treble staff. Not to sound dramatic, but the success of Dimitri Shostakovich's Symphony No. 5 is life or death. He was already under the eye of Joseph Stalin for writing formally, uh, formalistic or programmatic music. This was very frowned upon uh, for propaganda suspicions due to the opposing war. Uh, however, Shostakovich was clever in his writing. He wrote the piece to please Stalin, with also a noted theme of the symphony uh, is the making of a man. I saw a man in all of his experience at the center of the composition, in a finale of uh, tragically tense impulses of Either moments are resolved in optimism and the joy of living. A uh, controversial idea in presentation since the programmatic music was frowned upon, but the content of the program was how someone finds joy in life, which is the message that Joseph Stalin was pu uh, pushing. Long story short, it's a good thing that the premiere of the work received an estimated 40 minute ovation and celebration, otherwise, Dmitry Shostakovich may have mysteriously disappeared. This is a single F horn. 
This is what is most commonly given to beginner horn students. It only has one set of tuning throughout, kind of like a uh, trumpet, anything of that nature. It even follows the same finger in that. Uh, this particular one is an Alexander single F horn, if anybody cares to want to know. Uh, and the important one of this is that on the right side, you see it has three possible crooks coming out of the valve. But the next kind of horn, the double horn. This is the most common one that professionals, intermediates, college students, anybody can play. Uh, the main difference is that it now has four valves. The fourth one being the trigger. That is what switches from one side of the horn to the other. Because uh, you actually have two full sets of crooks, one on top of the other, which is why it looks like there's much more to uh, The double horn is first created in 1897 by a fellow named Gumbert. Uh, the first Krusty horn came out in 1898, and in the 1900, Schmidt added a thumb piston to make it easier to switch between sides of the horn. Uh, some notes on the horn due to the multiple crooks lining up within the harmonic series that can have multiple possible fingers. These are uh, they are benefits to the horn player where they line up because you can have some fingers that are really out of tune normally. But when you're playing in an ensemble, they can be right where you need to be. Or other fingering combinations help to project certain notes, which makes it easier to play. Uh, the main difference between, let me press it out, there's two main wraps of double horns. First one being the crusty, and the second one being the guy. The main difference is that this is a crusty horn. It's actually a, a con AD. Notice how with the valves, three of them line up, and then one's off to the side. That's one of the crusty wrap. They are a tighter wrap and tend to have sharper uh, turns within the piping itself. The other type of double horn that's very common is called a gyre wrap. The gyre wrap was invented by Carl, Carl Geyer in the early 20th century. His wrap of horn is to, uh, he's more open, uh, more free-blowing, and Difference between the two, yes, the crusty is tighter wrapped and more constricting in a way, but it's not a downside. Some people prefer that kind of playing or that kind of control. Uh, the Con AD was actually one of the most popular horns in like the common American uh, uh, orchestras, and you can walk into any band room and either find a Con AD or something modeled off the crusty wrap. Uh, the guy wrap is going to be more open and free blowing. Again, not a good or bad, it just depends on the preference of the uh, the main way you can tell this one is if you look for the three valves, the fourth one lines up with the other three. That signifies a guy around. The next thing on the horn you might see around is a decimal horn. Now, with all double horns, you have an F side and then a slightly higher B flat side. With a decimal horn, what you have is that same B flat side with an F alto side. What this does is it makes it easier for someone to play in the higher test form. Uh, they are used mainly within solos or orchestral excerpts, and uh, they kind of, kind of get expensive. Also, you can't necessarily play on a decimal horn for a lot of the lower horn stuff, so you still have to carry around the two instruments. What horn makers did in this case was they made a triple See here. And what a triple horn is, is if you take the double horn that has the B flat, sorry, the F and then the B flat, and you add that F alto side from the decimal horn all into one. It actually has five valves, the three of your fingers, and it's two different for your thumb. The first one you press with the joint of your thumb, and that activates the B flat side, just like on the double horn. But then you have another trigger you can press with the pad, or the fleshy part of your thumb, to access the alto. And I realized when doing this presentation and getting the information together, it's kind of ironic that we went from adding something that's really light, doesn't have much tubing on it, to the Amatonic horn, it was really, really heavy, bulky, and cumbersome. So then they made the next one, which then they added more stuff to. <laughs> uh, you won't see many triple horns because even on the low end, they're really expensive. Cheap one, last time I checked, was about 10 grand. Cheap one. It's a good one, a cheap one. 
So, that's the last of the PowerPoint presentation we have. Uh, after the recital, there will be a, a question and answer segment. If anybody has any questions, feel free to come up and ask. Uh, we have one more piece on the program. It is the Cast of uh, Tetuan by Kerry Turner. Um, sorry. Besides sounding amazing, it is also very challenging to put together. It is listed as a grade 7 difficulty. If that sounds like a weird scale, that's because the grading scale is out of 6. Uh, the work is a tone poem conceived during a visit in Morocco in 1988 by Kerry Turner himself. Uh, the term has meaning fortress or the big city you walk into, and it would have a little marketplace where people have like little vendors and maybe some trying to sell things. Uh, and then Tetuan is the name of the place. So that's what. Uh, Turner used different themes and, and tones, as you have to listen and feel like you're walking through a Middle Eastern market, including sounds of a snake charmer, that of a vendor selling percussion instruments. Um, in particular, one of the horns has a tapping of the bell, which represents a tambourine, and whistling to represent Chinese whistles. Uh, another thing to listen for is the range of this piece. Also, although there is a brass quintet version of this, the horn quintet version came first. That's including the second horn part having a high D above the staff, and the fifth horn part having a pedal E flat below the bass left staff. At this time, I would like to invite the Cal Quartet, the special guest, Dr. Lucas, to perform for you Carrie Turner's Casco Session. Thank you. 